Good evening, and thank you for having me. My name is Michael Zerpoli. I'm an aspiring science educator and mycologist. I'm currently a scientific instructional technician at the Evergreen State College from where I graduated and conduct my research. Over the past three years, I've been engaged in an assortment of research projects related to morel mushrooms. I've spent countless hours collecting, identifying, culturing, and attempting to cultivate morels from around Washington State. Tonight, I'm going to present you with the story of morel cultivation, covering both indoor and outdoor cultivation, as well as some findings from my own work. Before that, I will introduce the basic concepts that define a morel, important recent taxonomic revisions to the genus, and information related to morel biology, which is important for understanding methods used in morel cultivation, <clears throat> as well as understanding why folks have struggled so much to cultivate morels. First, I want to take a moment to outline why I believe morel cultivation is important. My interest in cultivation lies in developing a better understanding of morels as a whole. You will see throughout my presentation that there are many unanswered questions about the basic biology of morels. Having the ability to reliably cultivate morels in the lab gives the opportunity to study the morel in a way that is not possible in the field due to short fruiting seasons. Morel cultivation also helps protect sensitive environments in recovery and species with potentially limited distribution. The majority of commercial harvest in Western North America are burn morels collected in the first year following forest fires. These species are poorly understood and seemingly only appear in association with these fires, meaning sometimes more than a hundred years could pass between fruitings. We do not know the ecological role of these mushrooms in post-burn environments, and we do not know <clears throat> the impact of massive harvests over time. Sustainable cultivation also reduces the market price. Fresh morels often sell for anywhere between $20 and $35 a pound during peak season. These mushrooms are scientifically proven to have high amounts of essential minerals and nutrients and should be enjoyed by everyone, not just those with the ability to find them or those with deep enough pockets to buy them. Now I'm going to take a step back and talk about what exactly a morel is, and how it differs from other cultivated fungi. Morels are ascomycetes, one of six phyla of fungi. These fungi are the goody grabbers, fruiting early in the decay season, breaking down simple sugars. They often exhibit complex life cycles, including asexual stages. For mushrooms, ascomycetes typically form cup or sac-shaped fruit bodies, as well as hypogeous fungi like truffles. Morels are one of the few exceptions in terms of ascomycetes that produce large fruit bodies. In ascomycetes, spores are produced in eight spored cells known as acci. In morels, this occurs in the pits. The mycelial structure and growth pattern of morels and other ascomycetes is different from that of basidiomycetes. Basidiomycetes like Amanita muscaria, pictured here, are your more common cap and gill mushroom. I mention this phyla of fungi because the vast majority of cultivated fungi are basidiomycetes. Ascomycetes, on the other hand, have proven notoriously difficult to cultivate. Morels belong to the family Morchellaceae, which also contains one of the false morels, Verpa. In addition, there are a number of hypogeous fungi similar to true truffles, which are both edible and incredible, including the Oregon brown and black truffle. Another member of the family is Discotus, which is morphologically dissimilar to morels and more reminiscent of other cup fungi. True morels come in all shapes and sizes and are found in a variety of ecosystems across the world and are both edible and incredible. Morels have always been a source of taxonomic confusion, epitomizing the age-old argument of splitting and lumping, with some scientists recognizing as many as 30 species of morels, while others recognized as few as three. Before the application of molecular taxonomy, there were almost 350 different proposed names for morels on Index Fungorum. This inability to build a functional taxonomy resulted in confusing research highlighting inconsistent results, leading to more confusion surrounding morels, something that contributed greatly to difficulty cultivating morels. Differentiation was based on morphology, but as scientists have come to discover, the morel has a somewhat stagnant body plan with a surprising amount of morphological plasticity within a single species adding to the confusion. The old idea of IDing morels based solely on color is long gone. Within the past decade, the application of DNA 
analysis has revolutionized our understanding of morale diversity. Scientists looked at multiple informative loci and used combined data from samples collected worldwide to establish basic phylogeny and evolutionary history of morels. Additional analysis of underrepresented regions has led to the discovery of additional species. Other work has aimed at assigning either known names or new names to species identified in these other studies. In total, phylogenetic analysis identified 65 species within Morcella and delineated three major lineages or clades, the Rufabrunia clade, containing two species characterized by red blushing and growth forms resembling that of both other morel clades. This clade represents the basal lineage of all other morels. The Alata clade, black morels, which contains 36 species, characterized by longitudinal primary ridges with secondary transectory ridges and a more regular pitting pattern, most commonly found with conifers. And the Esculente clade, yellow morels, which contains 27 species, characterized by a more haphazard ridging and pitting pattern, more commonly found with hardwoods. 30 of the 66 species identified by earlier studies have been assigned scientific names. Since then, more species have been assigned names by other researchers. The progress in our understanding of morale diversity has opened the door for a deeper comprehension of issues that have plagued the study of this mushroom for decades. Something that makes the cultivation of morels so difficult is confusion surrounding some of the basic biology of the fungi. Things like their life cycle and trophic status are still in question to this day. There have been a number of life cycle proposals from morels over the years, with the first being presented in 1990 by Vulcan Lennard. This proposal has served as the basis for all future proposals and identified key steps in the life of a morel, which include the formation of primary and secondary mycelium, formation and germination of pseudosclerotia, and the development of fruit bodies. This proposal was nonspecific and was said to apply to all species of morels. Another life cycle proposed in 2014 attempted to integrate all the known research about morels and expanded the life cycle to include asexual stage. Both proposals are still considered theoretical. One other life cycle proposal worth mentioning was from 2007 and attempted to integrate conflicting reports concerning the trophic status of morels and also included some ecological conditions under which the life cycle takes place. There's evidence supporting numerable nutrient acquisition modes in morels, ranging from mycorrhizal to saprophytic. It has even been proposed that morels may switch between trophic modes throughout their lives. Confusion about this topic has been precipitated by taxonomic misidentification of morels studied in previous research. Saprophytic species are the only ones with any real potential for cultivation, so working this out is quite essential. More recently, scientists in China have begun identifying mating genes in morels, showing that most morels necessitate matching with a compatible partner for completion of the sexual part of their life cycle, a vital piece of information when selecting strains for cultivation. Needless to say, the topic of morel life cycles is not a closed case. More research is needed to develop our understanding of these fungi. Developing a better understanding of the life cycle and reproductive systems of morels is crucial for sustainable artificial cultivation, both indoor and out. Morels produce sclerotia, which was identified as an important part of its life cycle, and it's differentiated from true sclerotia on the basis of cellular characteristics and the presence of a rind the lack of a rind. Uh, pseudosclerotia formation is thought to be an important period in the life cycle, and it supposedly plays an essential role in the successful development of fruiting bodies of morels. Formation of pseudosclerotia is a response to unfavorable environmental conditions, and also a strategy that fungi use for nutrient storage, which suggests they are the products of a long-term biological evolution. Morel pseudosclerotia are also believed to enhance survival over winter, but the conditions that trigger fruit body formation arising from pseudosclerotia are not clearly understood. It is thought that pseudosclerotia can be produced from both primary mycelium and secondary mycelium, factors affecting mycelial growth and pseudosclerotia formation of some morel species has been investigated, but the results and conclusions have not been consistent due to the different strains and experimental designs. In addition, pseudosclerotia are not always formed under experimental conditions, and the ability and requirements of pseudosclerotia development varies greatly depending on the species. 
and cultivation in pseudosclerotia serve as the spot. Another important phase in the life cycle of morels is asexual reproduction. Much like pseudosclerotia, the exact role of asexual reproduction in the life cycle of morels is not entirely clear. One asexual stage of morels was first identified and reported by Molliard in 1904. In his attempts to cultivate morels outdoors on apple compost, he identified white mold on the soil surface as a hypomycetes and named it Constantinella. Although he attempted, he failed to observe the germination of the spores when isolated into various media. Until the application of DNA, Constantinella was considered a different genus from Morcella entirely. More recently, scientists directly linked asexual stages of morels to sexual stages, meaning their fruit bodies, using DNA analysis. Although we know the asexual phase of morels occurs in nature, we still do not know its role in the overall life cycle of a morel. Massive blooms of this powdery mildew have been reported uh, in indoor cultivation, as well as outdoor cultivation, as well as in abundance in burn sites before and after morels fruit. Uh, during the outdoor cultivation of morels, asexual reproduction is considered to be a necessary stage. And the uh, canidia cannot always germinate under experimental conditions and limited production is noted in laboratory cultures. Therefore, it's been hard to study in the lab and its role in the life cycle remains puzzling. I myself have observed asexual stages in morels in my attempts to cultivate the fungus, as well as in the field before and during sexual fruiting. These are examples of Constantinella in natural settings. Some are associated with spots that produce morels yearly, while others are colonies appearing after the soil had been inoculated with pseudosclerotia. Top right-hand corner is an inoculation, as well as the bottom left-hand corner. The other two are natural occurrences. And with this, we will move on to morel cultivation, uh, starting with indoor work. Cultivation of morels remains a rare and difficult task, despite more than 100 years of effort. The first reported successful indoor cultivation of morels came from San Francisco University master's student, Ronald Ower. Ron was a student of Henry Thayer's and had spent the prior three years collecting, culturing, and attempting to cultivate a variety of morels from around California. Despite failing to cultivate morels, Ron finished his thesis in the spring of 1980. With permission, Ron remained at the university working on his cultivation project, and in December of that year was the first person to observe the completed life cycle of a morel in artificial conditions. Ron proceeded to publish his work in Mycologia in 1982, which quickly caught the attention of mycologists. Inspired by the article, Michigan graduate student Gary Mills secured a grant from the Neogen Corporation to travel to San Francisco to work with Ron to further develop the systems for morel fruitification. Tragically, Ronald Ower was robbed and murdered in a park in San Francisco before the 1986 patent was issued. Determined to see Ower's dreams brought to fruition, Gary Mills and Jim Malachowski continued to develop the process and received two additional patents. Malachowski subsequently left Neogen, but Mills continued perfecting artificial cultivation of morels based on Ower's original work. Three patents issued from 1986 to 1989 revealed the optimal temperature, humidity, and ventilation for morel cultivation. Although the cultivation technique was based on one species, the patents claimed the methods applied to all morel species. The text of the patents were sufficiently detailed to claim rights, but sufficiently vague to curtail efforts by others to replicate the process. The key process described in their patents is an inoculation with the morel pseudosclerotia. Uh, growing pseudosclerotia is an intermediate step that's not required to cultivate most other saprophytic mushrooms. The work was a tremendous breakthrough in the dream of morel cultivation, and these methods are still used today. In 1990, Neogen Corporation partnered with Domino's Pizza to operate a test plant named Morel Mountain in Michigan, uh, which was overseen by Gary Mills. And then Illinois-based Terry Farms bought the rights to the cultivation process in 1993, and in 1995 constructed a growing facility in Auburn, Alabama, where Gary Mills was again the head of operations. 
To improve the economics and sustainability of morel cultivation, operations were focused on increasing pseudosclerotia mass and lipid content, inducing more reliable and simultaneous fruiting, and increasing yields, bed densities, and growth rates of morels. At the height of operations, the plant was shipping 3,000 pounds of morels per week from coast to coast. The plant, co the plant closed in the early 2000s due to financial difficulties. After several more transfers of cultivation rights and associated corporate mergers, morel cultivation resurfaced at Diversified Natural Products back in Michigan. This company started selling fresh morels in 2005 under the name Gourmet Mushrooms, Inc. Gary Mills was vice president for the Gourmet and Functional Foods division of this company. And in 2008, the indoor cultivation of morels in America was abandoned again due to the reduction of output and consistent issues with bacterial contamination in the fruiting substrate. However, in the past decade, the morel patent has again resurfaced, as has the name Gourmet Mushrooms, Inc., where Gary Mills still works. And they have been working with a farm in California and in Michigan and distribute and sell mushrooms under the name Mycopia. The company, in particular Gary Mills, is currently experimenting with morel cultivation, but no large-scale operations exist. Uh, Mills' name was associated with a paper published in 2019 concerning microbial communities associated with artificial cultivation of morels. It seems that they may be trying to figure out why contamination was such an issue in past operations. To date, no one else has been successful at a large-scale indoor cultivation of morels using the methods pioneered by Ower and refined by Mills and Associates, and very few have succeeded in growing morels indoors at all. Uh, but that is not for a lack of trying. The biggest issue for folks trying to replicate Ower and Mills' methods was a little bit of taxonomic confusion surrounding the mushroom. Ower had identified the mushroom he collected as Morchella esculente, but in reality, it was Morchella rufa brunia, a species that would not be formally described until the year 2000. Gary Mills, uh, suspicious of this, contacted Kerry O'Donnell in the 1990s, in the early 1990s, to discuss the possibility that uh, the morel was misidentified based on comparisons to his own collections of Morchella esculente, now called Morchella americana, from Michigan. Based on photographs and fresh samples, uh, the two came to the conclusion they were potentially working with the novel species. And it wasn't until later that decade when Guzman officially described Morchella rufa brunia that their suspicions were confirmed. The cultivated mushroom's identity was confirmed with genetic analysis by O'Donnell et al. in 2011, one of those early taxonomic papers I talked about. <clears throat> Science has shown that Morchella rufa brunia is one of the few morels capable of completing its whole life cycle without the need for matching with a compatible mating partner. It also is clearly saprophytic, growing in wood chip beds and other ornamental settings, making it a prime candidate for cultivation. Uh, it also has a very limited distribution on the West Coast, so it was a very happenstance type of thing that Ronald Ower managed to find this mushroom. In 2010, uh, Siegel Masfini in Israel reported a successful cultivation of Morchella rufa brunia that she had isolated from that country. The laboratory scale technique that she developed hasn't been transferred to any sort of large scale industrial farming. She did, however, provide a pretty detailed scientific analysis of morel cultivation, documenting fundamental periods during development using microscopy. She used methods proposed by Ower to cultivate pseudosclerotia these pseudosclerotia then served as the seeds, which were then inoculated into compost and water treatment was applied to stimulate the germination of the pseudosclerotia. She pointed out that the primary reason for the failure of morel cultivation is the deficiency in knowledge about the development of the fruit body and difficulties and unknowns regarding species selection. The only other reported success of indoor morel cultivation in the scientific literature is from a Penn State master's student in the spring of 2019. This student successfully adapted methods currently employed in China's outdoor morel industry for indoor cultivation. And although the student attempted to cultivate multiple species, she was only successful in cultivating Morchella rufa brunia. 
Uh, interestingly enough, the culture of Morcella rufa brunia she was using was isolated from a cultivated morel from Terry Farms in the 1990s. This work highlighted the differences and similarities between methods originally proposed by Ower and methods currently used in China. More than anything, this work gave more detailed parameters for the successful fruitification of Morcella rufa brunia, outlining temperature and humidity in a way that no one had really outlined this before. For more than a century, various methods of outdoor morel cultivation have been attempted. The first report of outdoor cultivation of morels occurred in France in 1882 in association with Jerusalem artichokes and was reported by Ernest Rosé. In 1904, Marin Molliard claimed to have cultivated morels in apple compost. However, there was no evidence demonstrating that they were actually responsible for the morels that were growing. Uh, there's a lot of speculation that they might have just been naturally occurring morels. <clears throat> Since Ower's report of success in the 1980s, numerous scientists in China uh, started to focus their research studies on morel cultivation. The first reports of morel cultivation in China was proposed by Ding in 1983, though he failed to publish detailed records of the cultivation process. Zhu Daxi, who is honored as the father of morels in China, was issued the first morel cultivation patent in 1994 followed by four more for his field-based cultivation methods of morels, upon which the current industry is based. The techniques he reported are considered bionic cultivation, since the management factors such as light, humidity, and temperature are largely based on local environmental conditions. For this reason, morel cultivation in China is not considered truly artificial. The first patent he was issued in 1994 was based on the successful fruiting of Morcella esculente. Much like in Ower's original patent, this mushroom may have been misidentified. Use of these methods have been limited given its poor stability and re re reproducibility. The outdoor cultivation of morels based on the use of Populus rotundifolia, rotundifolia and straw succeeded in 2002 and was commercialized in Yuan province in 2004. However, this technique is limited due to its wood consumption. In 2005, a patent for the cultivation of Morcella was issued for S.C. Miller. The key process of his methods was inoculating a tree root system with Morcella mycelium. Reports of success are unsubstantiated, but Miller still sells inoculated trees through a company called Morel Farms. Apart from Miller, Researchers in China also attempted to use the theorized mycorrhizal relationship between Morcella mycelium and tree seedlings, but failed to report successful symbiosis. Compared with the cultivation process described by Dr. Zhu, the production period is much longer and techniques more complex, so it has been by and large abandoned. The most important progress in morel cultivation in China is the invention and application of exogenous nutrient bags. In 2000, scientists from Shaiwan Academy of Forestry obtained the fruit body of a morel in a flower bed when a bag of substrate typically used to grow morels was left sitting, uh, morel spawn was left sitting on top of inoculated mound. Follow-up studies demonstrated reproducibility and confirmed that the exogenous nutrient supply is essential for the outdoor cultivation of morels. The idea of applying exogenous nutrients initially originated from Ower's work, and thus he has actually been honored as the father of morels by some Chinese scholars. Uh, and this process of obtaining nutrients is very different from all other cultivated fungi, especially basidiomycetes. The theory of using nutrient bags is that the sexual development of morels requires a comparatively nutrient poor environment, but the nutrient poor soil substrate is not able to supply enough nutrients for the growth of the newly formed mycelium. Therefore, additional nutrients are required to support the formation of mycelium. The additional nutrients are sometimes later removed in order to facilitate formation of fruiting bodies. Based on limited information, the composition of nutrient bags does not appear to be all that important. There are many available formulas for nutrient bags listed in Chinese patents. A common recipe is 70% wheat grain, 15% sawdust, 10% chaff, 1% vermiculite, 4% soil. The artificial cultivation of morels has attracted an increasing number of farmers and is receiving the enthusiastic support of governmental organizations and policies in China. To date, the cultivation in farmlands and forest farming are the main morel cultivation patterns in China. 
Cultivation can be performed in various terrains, including plain hill zones, plateau zones, and mountain zones. Given that dim light is needed and direct sunlight is harmful to the growth of morels, a canopy is necessary. <clears throat> Based on these methods, the outdoor artificial cultivation of morel mushrooms has been rapidly developed in China in recent years. In 2011, the scale cultivation of morels in the field began with 200 hectares and expanded to 1,600 hectares by 2016, according to recent Chinese surveys. Yields of fresh morels is between zero in 17,000 pounds per hectare. The total amount of field cultivated fresh morels was estimated to be 500 tons in 2015, 2016. In 2016, the cultivated area of morels in China was roughly 10,000 hectares compared to just 400 hectares in 2011. Morel cultivation regions are located in more than 20 Chinese provinces. Shaiwan province accounts for 44% of China's production area. The industry is still expanding, but common significant differences are noted between cultivation sites and issues with sustainability have been reported. A continuous cropping cycle has demonstrated some problems in morel cultivation. Growing morels on the same soil tends to decrease yields after two to three years, which forces farmers to find new land to cultivate. Unless researchers soon determine the essential nutrients for morel production, the cost of continuously cultivating new land for morel production may become prohibitive. The quality of the spawn largely affects the entire morel cultivation process. Much like indoor cultivation, pseudosclerotia is used as spawn, just grown in larger quantities, often using bags instead of jars. Much like the nutrient bags, materials used for spawn production are not standardized. Choosing isolates for spawn based on quality of pseudosclerotia production is paramount, as is choosing morels with the appropriate, with the appropriate trophic mode. One must also consider the mating compatibility of strains. Until there are industry standards in place for morel spawn production, there will continue to be issues with sustainable morel cultivation. Species currently cultivated in China include the landscape morel, Morchella importuna, and two burn morels, Morchella sextillata and Morchella eczemia. Identification of the cultivated morels was based on morphological characters and molecular evidence. Uh, these species all belong to the black morel clade and are all saprophytic. Uh, Morchella importuna accounts for 80 to 90% of the cultivated area in China. An important management technique during morel cultivation is pest control. Uh, there's a lot of competitive contaminants, including trichoderma, aspergillus, rhizopus, mucinor, neurospora, caprinus, as well as a whole host of bacteria. Uh, common insects include limax, mites, springtail, and maggots. And in China, all chemical pesticides are absolutely prohibited, but physical and biological control techniques are commonly used. I'm now going to talk a bit about my own attempts at morel cultivation, both indoor and out, as well as outline common methods used for indoor and outdoor cultivation. I've spent over a year attempting to replicate the methods outlined in Ower's patent, but instead of using Morcella rufibrunia, I primarily focused on Morcella importuna, using strains collected locally. I failed to successfully cultivate morels indoors, but I learned a lot from the process. I have numerous theories as to why my work failed. Considering that recent studies have shown that Morcella importuna requires matching with compatible mating partners, and most of my isolates were from single fruit bodies, I should have probably attempted to combine strains for a better chance of success. Uh, a better solution, obviously, would have been just to work with the species described in the patents. Uh, this is something that I'm now doing. And again, that's because Morcella rufibrunia can complete its sexual fruiting independent of mating partners. Another issue that I had to deal with was environmental conditioning. I was working down in a broken uh, in an old broken down beer cooler. Uh, it's very obvious that the different morel species require different conditions to develop and protocol for one species is not necessarily going to work for another species, uh, especially during fruit body development. It's a very sensitive time for the morel and the conditions that it needs for development are uh, need to be controlled very finely. 
If we do end up adapting indoor methods for different species, we're going to have to work out how to develop new environmental parameters for different stages of growth. Here is a basic overview of Ower's methods. He presented two variations of the same basic methods, with the main difference being the amount of pseudosclerotia used as inoculum, the depth of soil inoculated, and the addition of uh, exogenous nutrients through inverted grain jars post inoculation. For the sake of time, I'm just going to focus on one variation, and I'm not going to list in all the painstaking detail the particular temperatures, relative humidities, and substrate moisture contents for each step. If you are interested in this level of detail, uh, the patents are publicly available, and I encourage you to read them. The first step in the process is growing spawn. Uh, Pseudosclerotia is grown in jars using perforated foil to separate a layer of nutrient-rich grain from a layer of nutrient-deficient soil. The soil is inoculated, the mycelium grows through the nutrient-rich layer and translates nutrients back to the soil, the nutrient-deficient soil, which forms pseudosclerotia over time. This whole process takes about four to six weeks. <clears throat> A sterilized nutrient poor soil mixture is then wetted and inoculated with pseudosclerotia at a rate of about six to 30 cc per square meters at about one to four centimeters deep. A recipe of 25% sand, 64% fir bark, 7% sphagnum, and 3% redwood is what was used by Ower for his nutrient deficient substrate. And again, this is comparatively nutrient deficient substrate compared to a jar full of grain jars or a jar full of grain. Trays are then placed in the dark at room temperature and they're allowed to colonize. And about one week, hyphae will grow from the pseudosclerotia and totally colonize the tray. Jars are inverted onto the surface of the substrate. Hyphae grows upward through the holes in the second layer of the foil, gathers nutrients, and distributes those nutrients back to the mycelial colonies in the nutrient-deficient substrate. Feeding continues for a period of between 7 to 40 days, typically about 16 days. At the end of this feeding period, both asexual reproduction and pseudosclerotia may be observed in substantial numbers on the surface of the substrate. After removing the nutrient source, one liter of water is added per square meter of substrate surface and vegetative growth is allowed to continue for a period of about 10 days. After this period, the pseudosclerotia are mature. The mature pseudosclerotia and associated mycelium, rich in stored nutrients but deprived of exogenous nutrients, are now ready for exposure to high amounts of water, which contribute to the induction of the sexual cycle. Preferably, the substrate and morel mycelium are hydrated by a slow percolation of water through the substrate for a period of between 12 and 36 hours. Water is added to the substrate at a rate of between about 250 and 1,000 milliliters per hour per square meter of substrate surface area. Following hydration, the substrate is allowed to drain and the cultures may be aspirated to further remove water. One to three days after hydration, morel primordia start to form, a growth period extending from the initial appearance of primordia until the morel ascocarp reaches a height of about 30 millimeters represents an important period for the morel development. Unless very favorable growth conditions are maintained, immature morels are prone to abort. After the morel reaches the height of 30 millimeters, conditions are maintained that are favorable to the continued development and maturation of the mushroom. Although I did not see any fruit body formation in my own work, I did observe some very strange mycelial blooms, especially in response to the addition and removal of nutrients and heavy watering. Uh, these are just some pictures of that. For my attempts at outdoor cultivation, I established plots on the evergreen organic farm to attempt to replicate methods currently used for mass production of morels in China. The outdoor methods I used were outlined in the Penn State thesis mentioned earlier. I attempted to adopt these methods for the Pacific Northwest, focusing on Morcella importuna. I will now go over some basic methods used in China for field cultivation of morels. The first step is site selection. 
Folks may choose different cultivating patterns according to the various weather conditions in their region. Areas that are suitable for morel cultivation are typically in plain and basin areas, locations that are flat, near water sources, of good drainage ability, and with loose soil. Generally speaking, fields suitable for plants should work well for morel production. Before plowing, weeds and plant debris from last season should be removed. Moreover, calcium oxide or calcium carbonate at 800 pounds per hectare or plant ashes at 2,600 pounds per hectare can be sprayed onto the soil to adjust the pH to 6.4 or 8 points, between 6.4 and 8.7. The land is typically then plowed to build beds or furrows, depending on the method being used. Spawning typically occurs between September and November when the outside high temperatures drop to around 68. Uh, sclerotias spawned at a rate of about 50 to 100 grams per square meter. Spawn is either spread directly onto the bed with an additional layer of moist soil on top or it's buried in V-shaped furrows uh, and then covered again with moist soil. Nutrient bags with openings are added to the soil with the openings facing the soil surface approximately 7 to 20 days after spawning. One bag is used for every two square meters. Bags are removed 20 days before development of fruit bodies. After removing the bags, heavy watering is recommended between one to three times onto the beds. Apart from the addition and subsequent removal of supp supplemental nutrients, the other way to stimulate fruit body development is through heavy watering. Primordia begin developing when the outside temperature is appropriate for morel development, so March through April, earlier if they are grown in a greenhouse, and as soon as two to three months post-inoculation, if conditions are right. It is worth noting that the fruiting bodies of some Pazaiza species have been commonly observed in Chinese production systems about one week before the fruiting of Morcella. The pins of morels are fragile and can be damaged when temperatures are less than 32 degrees. When small immature pins develop into small fruit bodies, air humidity should be maintained between 80 to 95 percent and the soil moisture levels between 28 and 35 percent. When fruit bodies grow between one and a half to three centimeters tall, the air humidity should be maintained while the soil moisture should be reduced to 18 to 25%. In the later maturation period, when fruiting bodies are growing quickly, it is recommended to maintain the temperature at around 60 degrees and increase soil moisture to 20 to 25%. During the maturation period, the air humidity should be lowered to 70 to 85%. In my work, 18 beds were established in mid-January with six plots receiving nutrients about three weeks later. I observed morel mycelium, fully colonized plots, and produced large quantities of constantinella. This kind of growth was only observed in plots that were inoculated with morel spawn, regardless of the presence of nutrient bags. Six weeks after placing the nutrient bags, half were removed. I only removed half because there's conflicting reports about the actual need to remove the nutrients from the plot. You saw some pictures earlier of morels obviously fruiting in the presence of nutrient bags. So I just kind of wanted to test both approaches. Uh, all of the plots that were inoculated with morel spawn had wood chips that were almost fully bound together with massive blooms of Constantinella. I also saw these other weird growths. Unfortunately, the pandemic kind of swept in and prevented me from daily monitoring and watering of my plots, and I did not observe fruit bodies in 2020. And that is where I've been at with outdoor cultivation. If you're interested, you can take some more simple steps to try to encourage the growth of morels in or around your area. Spore and tissue slurries are a common way of introducing morels. Uh, rinsing morels intended for cooking is a great way to aggregate spores for slurries. There's mixed reports of success regarding these methods, but I know from personal experience it can work. Uh, it's important to know how much... It's important to know which morels you're using 
uh, in the space you're attempting to grow and know which morels do well in your area. Uh, you're not going to just be able to grow any old morel out in your yard. So you definitely want to think about species when it comes to that, that, that kind of stuff. You can also use the aforementioned methods or a variation of the methods used in China when building garden spaces as a way to grow morels. Uh, I've done this in the past. This process will necessitate saprophytic species, and your best bets are obviously Morcella importuna and Morcella rufabrunia, depending on where you live. If you're more advantageous and you want to fully replicate methods used in China, some of the burn species may be acceptable alternatives, but success will greatly depend on the strain selection in the area that you're working in. Uh, here's a garden that I set up using morel spawn last spring, and these are some pictures of some Constantinella that I observed in those gardens just here in the past couple weeks. I'm hoping to see some fruit bodies there this spring. Well, despite being so popular, we still have a lot of unanswered question about morels from their life cycles to the preferred reproductive modes to the way they get their food. It seems like every time we answer a question about morels, we find ourselves asking at least a hundred more. Uh, the field-based cultivation of morels in China has been an invaluable resource for our understanding of the genus, but the holy grail would definitely be the ability to fruit ascocarps reliably in the lab. If we could do this, we'd be able to address questions about morels that have evaded enthusiasts for decades. Uh, and I just want to encourage you all to take a moment and appreciate all that morels have to offer, aside from just their delicious flavor. And I want to take a moment to thank uh, the North American Mycological Association for having me this evening. I would like to thank my mentor, Paul Prisbelowitz, uh, for all his work and patience with me over the years. Mike Bug, uh, Carrie O'Donnell, Lolita Calabria, all the staff and science faculty at the Evergreen State College, uh, generous grants from Puget Sound Mycological Society, and my former research partner, best friend, and the person who definitely listens to me talk about morels more than anyone else in the world, Heidi Steinbach. With that, I say good night.